Welcome to the show known as Conversations with Ralph Walker. Remember in, back in school, you would hear the term about the Great Migration, and that was the exodus of black folks from the South moving up north, looking for job opportunities, or maybe just a place to stay. Well, I'm honored to have here in the studio two very distinguished guests. One is Kathy Myers. How are you Kathy doing today? Meyer. Okay, get that Hi. Foley in there. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. And I'm also honored to have uh, Dr. Hillary Jinks. Hello. All right. How are you doing today? Very good. Thank you. All right. Uh, when we talk about the Great Migration, uh, was a result of what was happening to some of the viewers out there. Well, the first wave of the Great Migration would have been starting in the teens and 1920s. And really it was a result of new job opportunities, especially industrial job opportunities in the north, northern cities like Detroit and Chicago. Um, and also the growth of you know, railroads, more railroad competition meant cheaper tickets. Oh. So more people could afford to get on the railroad and leave the south and go to those places. All right, now I can hear a viewer out there saying right now, oh. Ralph, what, what's the background of Dr. Jenkins? Uh, <laughs> Jenks, tell us something. What did you uh, originally grow up at? I know that's a story within itself. Oh, yeah. Um, I grew up all over the place. Uh, that's, that's the easiest way to answer that question. Um, and I, I ended up in Los Angeles uh, going to school. My undergrad in college was at University of Southern California. And that's why I ended up going back for my graduate degree also. And you majored in what? what, what you uh, I was in a program called American Studies and Ethnicity. I was really interested in kind of, you know, what happened in the time of my parents and my grandparents. How did, how did everything come together with them to end up producing me? Now, do you have a, a certificate in architecture or something along that way? I, I have a graduate certificate in historic preservation. Which means to the viewer out there that might not have a clue, what does that mean? Um, <laughs> it means I took some classes. <laughs> it, it means that, um, I mean, really historic preservation is where cities and, and history meet, right? It's, it's yes. about preserving previous layers of the landscape in a city so that we have some understanding of where it's been as well as where it's going. And, and why is that important? Well, some folks say bring in the wrecking ball, tear yeah. it down, and others say we should keep this. I, I think it's very important to have a sense of where you come from, um, especially, you know, a city like L.A., which has been, there's been a long history of running the bulldozer through it right. in L.A., um, and there's been so many waves of newcomers to L.A., and if you don't keep around any of what, what used to be here, how's anybody supposed to situate themselves or understand, you know, the folks who came before me, the situation that I've arrived in has a past, and how do I fit into it? So how do you answer the question when people say, that's old though, we need new modern structures? I say you can do both. <laughs> and I also say, you know, there's no reason you can't turn an old building to new uses. There's buildings in downtown, they strip away walls and they find like these things of batchelder tiles and murals and, you know, all these amazing beautiful artistic things that we just could never create again. So that's a great aspect of it is we get to keep the beauty. Um, and also that, that neighborhood in particular is kind of, it's unique to LA to have that sort of urban scale because we have tended to be more of a spread out suburban place. All so. right, now to the viewers out there that may be wondering, Brownsville, what is that all about? A bunch of brown buildings or what is it? <laughs> Well, Bronzeville, originally the term comes from Chicago's South Side. So yes, with that great migration to Chicago, um, the South Side is where most African Americans ended up living due to segregation and restrictive covenants. And it got nicknamed Bronzeville. And so the term carried, you know, other places, sometimes the African American neighborhood would get called that. And in LA, uh, in particular, we, we got a Bronzeville in World War II. Um, Wait a minute. L.A. had a Bronzeville? For a very brief time in the 1940s, yes. And that is something that you've been working on? Yes. Um, the, my my re research for my doctorate was on the Little Tokyo neighborhood of Los Angeles, and that is the area that became Bronzeville during World War II. Little Tokyo had black folks living in? Yes. Well, it didn't have Japanese-American folks living there anymore. They were uh, taken away and interned during the war. So it's empty space, and at the same time, you have a lot of African Americans. You had 5,500 people a month 
coming into the city to go to work in defense plants, so you know shipyards and, and aerospace factories, and um, well, it would have been just airplane factories. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, you know they needed housing, and about ninety percent of the city was barred from African Americans being able to live in the housing by these restrictive covenants. This little section of LA. How big is Little Tokyo? It's not very big. It's about, you know, arguably about maybe 10 to 15 square blocks. Before World War II, it was, it was larger. It stretched farther south, almost to Fifth Street. Um, and then on the west side, the border would have been Main Street. It's, it's, not, it's not a large and area. It took on how many people? Well, they have a d few different estimates. The, okay. the highest estimate was that by 1944, they had about 80,000 people crammed into Little Tokyo. And the area that probably had how many folks? I think that Before many. the war, living there was probably maybe max of 20,000. So it was very crowded. What happened to the Japanese people? Did they die? What happened? <laughs> what, what, what was the well, no, academic they're... that broke out? Well, what happened was, um, obviously, Pearl Harbor gets bombed December 7th, 1941. Kind of familiar with that date. And uh, within three months, the president, President Roosevelt, had signed Executive Order 9066, and that authorized the military commanders to say, the West Coast is a military zone, and all ethnic Japanese have to be removed from this military zone. So it didn't matter if you were alien Japanese or if you were a citizen, if you were born here, Japanese American, if you were ethnically Japanese, you had to be removed from the West Coast. Now, how disruptive was that if you were Japanese? Well, huge. Um, I mean, the, the orders came down, the first one started in April, and the average is people had about two weeks, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. Um, get rid of everything you own. You can't take it with you, like your car, for example. You can't take your car, you have to sell it. Um, and take what you can carry to the train station on this date, and you'll be removed. It was, it was a very difficult, uncertain time. We were just heading into a war, and people knew that the Japanese American folks were in a bind. So what did they do with their homes? They sold the homes? Or? Um, well, a lot of them signed agreements to rent them out for the duration if they owned their home. Um, How did they, they know had, the duration? Well, Here did somebody <laughs> tell you. <laughs> That's you kind of the problem. Yeah, <laughs> when they came back, they, didn't, they couldn't get in their houses, actually, because they were allowed back before the end of the war, and they'd signed the lease for the duration. So pr plenty of people couldn't get into their house. For until. the duration of the war? Yeah. Now, what were some of these uh, concentration camps? I know they gave them a, a, a nice name. A, uh, yeah, a well, they, they like to call them relocation centers Relocation at the time. centers. Um, like, like it was real nice to be uprooted. And all that. Well, but exactly, exactly. Uh, there was 10 of them, and they were uh, the ones in California, which are kind of, I think, more what, better yeah. known to people in L.A., Manzanar up in the Owens Valley, and Tule Lake, which is up by the Oregon border. Now, let's get back to Little Tokyo. Right and talking about the climate of the times. People are being moved from them, their homes. Uh, cars and vehicles are sold at a loss, and you have all this vacancy everywhere. And real estate is probably wondering, what are we gonna do with this? And who makes the decision to say, bring in black folks? Or well, how did that come about? It's, it's kind of a, it's a little bit of an open question. I mean, the property owners were very concerned. They were like, well, we still have to pay our property taxes, but we lost our tenants. So they went through kind of a bunch of different ideas about what to do. There's a lot of African-American folks coming into town for these jobs in the, in the war industries. And the train station happens to be right on the edge of Little Tokyo. And it kind of started to work out that, you know, someone, and I'm, we're not really sure who, was the first person to say, hey, let's rent here. I think really what it was was that some African Americans coming off the trains went up to the hotels and it kind of started to snowball from there. All right, now suddenly you get families getting off the train mm -hmm. from the south and other areas and they're looking for places to rent. Yep. And they probably come with a whole lot of folks, okay? Not just one and two people, maybe quite a bit. And you had this limited area and due to restricted covenants, they couldn't go beyond this area. So you get this deluge of people in this area. How did that, I mean, forcing the fit in a sense, how did? Yes, very much so. Um, it was really, the overcrowding was a really serious health concern at the time. Um, you'd have situations where what used to be a storage room 
that didn't have any windows. It just had like a skylight for ventilation and you had five people living in that space. What are the structures in uh, Little Tokyo? Is it apartments or is it housing? Well, it's what it's is a it? lot. They, they had some hotels. You're thinking like five, six story kind of brick okay. type hotels. Um, a lot of commercial buildings where the first story was retail and then they'd have some, yeah, yeah. some units upstairs. And so most of the first story retail space was taken over by African American merchants and entrepreneurs. And then they, everything else got rented out as a bed. And people used to, they called it sleep hot. They would go in shifts in, a, in one bed. So like somebody would be coming in and be like, well, I sleep from 3 a.m. to you know, 8 a.m. and then I get up and go to work and then I go out and then I get to come back and sleep from 3 to 8. Ew. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So they got jobs. They got money. Mm -hmm. They got a place to stay. What do they do for entertainment? <laughs> well, that was what some of the entrepreneurs were doing down on the first floor. Um, they had a lot of clubs that opened up in Bronzeville during World War II. What were some of those clubs? Oh, there were places like the Cobra Club, um, Shep's Playhouse, which was run by Gordon Shepard, who was a, he'd been a cameraman on black movies. On, so he was tied into Hollywood. And uh, he used to bring down a lot of big names to okay. the clubs, like Gene Kelly and Pearl Bailey and people like that. And in particular, Bronzeville's kind of famous for having, participating in bebop. It's kind of one of the places where bebop first came to LA. Explain bebop to those young folks out there. Oh. I um, think they invented it or did <laughs> something with it. Well, bebop is kind of a, I mean, we had been in the era of the big bands and right. swing and everything, and then bebop comes in and it's, it's you don't dance to bebop. You, you listen to it and you appreciate it, but you, you can't really do a foxtrot to it. Um, and uh, Charlie Parker, who's you know the famous right. saxophonist, he came out to Bronzeville in 1946, and he played at the Finale Club. In, at, in Little Tokyo? In Bronzeville, yes. Oh, oh. And uh, his, his band included Miles Davis, when Miles Davis was just 20 years old and had sort of just getting known as a trumpet player. I mean, Charlie Parker did some recording in LA while he was out here, although not, not in the club. It's not like a live recording from the club or okay. anything like that. Now, did they have any publications printed during that period of time? Or? Jet Magazine might ring a bell. Uh, sure. Any other publication? Well, the local papers were really the ones you, you look to to find information about Bronzeville. So the, the local African-American papers was California Eagle, mm -hmm. which is published by Charlotte Bass, um, the Los Angeles Sentinel, which was Colonel Washington, right. and the LA Tribune. Uh, notable publication at that time, Ebony Magazine. Did they explore this at all? They did. They came in in 1946. Um, this was when the Japanese Americans had come back, okay. and they covered basically what was happening once the Japanese Americans had returned to Bronzeville. They come back to town. They see a building that they once owned. All these people are living in this building and operating stores, and they have to go stay at uh, some other location. I mean, you come back, and um, a lot of people, like I said, they, they either they didn't have a place to live at all, mm -hmm. or even if they had a house, because they'd signed a lease for the duration, the war is still going on when they come back, and so they don't still don't have a place to live. So most of them were living in places like the churches and the temples in Little Tokyo reopened and were running as hostels, and people would like, put up cots with sheets between them and were sleeping there. Um, so that's how they came back into the neighborhood. And really, you know, wait had to face wait, it, it wait, changed wait, a wait, lot. Wait, so tell me how this chemistry is working out now. It, you know, it was tough. Um, on, in some sense, there was some real tensions that developed. Some of that was because, the, like I said, the property owners, who were more of these old Anglo families, um, decided to start renting to the Japanese Americans coming back. Oh, time for you folks to move. Pretty much, yes. They they actively stated, you know, let's let's reestablish Little Tokyo. Let's move these folks out. You know, let's clean this place up. So they would uh, sign leases to the Japanese Americans, and the stipulation in the lease would be, you know, you have to rent uh, out all the storefronts to Japanese businesses, for example. So that obviously caused a lot of tension. So this appeared to me, and from what you're saying, that it was Stoke tension? I mean, there were tensions. There definitely were. But there was also a major effort on the part of both communities to try to work together. So, you know, 
uh, Sam Evans is an African American. He ran a restaurant called the Bamboo Room in Bronzeville, and he hired Japanese American waiters and waitresses. Um, Almina Lomax hired Japanese Americans to write columns in the Tribune because she thought it would be important for African Americans to get a perspective of what Japanese Americans were experiencing coming back and have that conversation. That still seems like a lot of tension because I'm thinking, here it is, I used to be this business person or this person here, and then I'm getting a job as a waiter or a reporter. Mm -hmm. It's good, but it ain't quite the same thing. Yeah, no, there was a lot of anxiety among the returning Japanese Americans, and then you compound that with, you know, a few months after they come back, the war ends, and then we go into demobilization. So, so then a lot of people are losing their jobs. All right, factory. we've been talking about the adults. What about the children? How did they deal with this? I mean, they didn't have a choice. No. <laughs> okay. Didn't. Now, is there one school in that area that they probably had to go to? Or how did education fit in for? Well, there were multiple schools. Um, and Little Tokyo didn't have a, a lot of kids in the neighborhood. It wasn't a very kid-friendly neighborhood um, because it had been zoned industrial um, back in the teens and they never kept up any of the housing that was already there. So it was not a very kid-friendly place. If you had kids, you tried not to raise them in Bronzeville to the degree that you could, or Little Tokyo. Um, but they did have this playground and nursery school. So it was, it could have been some Oh yeah, in the in the nursery school in particular, the Pilgrim House Nursery School, um, they had uh, a variety of kids of a diverse diversity of races. Mm. So now, was there restriction in schools outside of this area? I don't know how integration was going on at that period of time. Well, the schools in the Little Tokyo area had actually always been really mixed. Okay. Um, more so before the war, before Bronzeville, it was more a mix of a. Um, Japanese American and Mexican American children at a lot of the schools. Um, and then African Americans were farther south along Central Avenue and the schools that they attended tended to be mostly African American but they'd always have some like white students, immigrant children especially, and Mexican American kids. So there was a harmony period? There, there really wasn't a period of time where they were working on it. So blacks owned the business. Well, they, they rented. They rented the business. Right, until their leases ran out. And, and then when usually. When the Japanese came back, they worked for the black folks that were running the business. They did do that, yes. And then Afri or when did Japanese Americans. Did they socialize Americans, much? Um, somewhat. Somewhat. We have, we have a lot of sort of anecdotal evidence to that effect. Anecdotal, um, there was like a, which means? Oh, which means um, people telling stories. So okay. you kind of have to rely that they, they've told you the truth and that they remember accurately. But presuming that they do, we do have that kind of evidence. All right. So you have all these people in close proximity, living together, or leaving when the sun goes down. Did anyone fall in love? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I was going to say, <laughs> that becomes, yes. we're, we're, now we're yeah. really getting into a whole yeah, different actually. story. <laughs> okay. Is this my segue for Kathy Foley Myers to step in? How you doing today? Good, good. Quietly, you sat and you heard the <laughs> early beginnings. Yeah. What was the project all about that you were involved in? Well, I created Project Bronzeville um, mostly because I'd been making art uh, inspired by Bronzeville since 2004. Uh, I completed my first piece in 2005. Um, it was a glass mixed media piece of glass and neon and a little bit of wood and images from the period. Um, but I started working on my second one and then I, I kind of wanted to do something larger, um, not just with art, but uh, in 2009 I saw the play Bronzeville for the first time and was really moved by it. And I thought, wow, I'd like to somehow bring that together with my artwork. And then I had a conversation with um, Christopher Imenez West, who was the former history curator at the California African American Museum, and we started talking about Bronzeville. And I said, you know, I'd really like to do a whole project where we have um, art, we have theater, we have music, and we have some sort of discussion that kind of brings everything together. How did you team up oh, with okay. Hillary, yes. Dr. James? Yeah, well, actually, yeah. I was <laughs> taking a photography course 
And also, I was reviewing plays for the Los Angeles Reader. But why Low Tokyo? Well, because my beat, so to speak, was downtown because nobody else would go down there because they thought downtown was too dangerous. So I would go to a lot of small theaters and LATC and kind of in the neighborhood. And whenever I would walk the streets, I would just get this weird feeling. I would Are you always, walking the streets by yourself? With my camera. With your camera. And just Looking snapping. like a local tourist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I just kept wondering if black people had ever lived in the neighborhood. There was something about it. I remember there used to be a mural kind of down on First Street, and it was mostly depicting Japanese people, but there was one guy in the corner playing the saxophone. And who was that who guy? I have, I have absolutely no idea, but I, you know, he appeared to be African American, so, but I was never really, really sure. And then one day, I remember I came down to take photographs, and I was putting money in the meter and I was right outside of this store owned by a Japanese woman. And as I got out of my car and put money in the meter, we, our eyes met, and she very deliberately came up to the door and kind of closed it in my face. And I thought to myself, yes, <laughs> we were here. Well, you remember what year that was? <laughs> it was probably 1994, five or six. I was, I was trying to get a timeline, maybe the LA riots or um, You know, it was definitely after the LA yeah. riots. So um, that might have stoked a little. It could be, but fear. it was there was something sort of familiar and practiced about the way that it happened. So, and then a few years later, I was taking a tour um, given by the Los Angeles Conservancy because I was going to become a docent, and you have to take tours in order to do that. Describe that to folks out there. Um, the LA Conser oh a docent. Um, a, well, the LA Conservancy is a preservation organization, nonprofit in Los Angeles, and they hire people to give tours of different sections of the city to kind of, you know, get everyone, the public, to appreciate what we have, you know, in terms of history, because generally it's felt that LA doesn't really have anything worth preserving. Um, but for me, I always think of LA as like an architectural dig where all the levels are above ground. Mm -hmm. You just have to kind of walk around and they're all there, but they're kind of hidden under, you know. All right, so you're exploring dirt. Little Tokyo. So I was. Second calling, it exactly. brings you back again. And the first words out of the tour guide's mouth were, well, you know, black people used to live here. And I was like, aha, I, I knew it. I discovered gold. Yeah. Your and first then, nugget of information. Exactly, and then a few months later, I was taking a course in mixed media design using neon, and I created my first Bronzeville piece which was a glass cabinet with neon and photographs and images from the period. And then a few years later, I created my second Bronzeville piece. All right. That's and right. then... There's a viewer out there that's saying, mix media. media. It means working with whatever type of material works for you. So in my case, it's metal, glass, neon, wood, um, sometimes paint. Um, but you know, just it's. But what 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 brought you to that? What brought you to mixed media? Um, basically, I needed a way to. I would get Im pictures in my mind, and I would need a way to create physically what I was seeing inside my head. So I would think about materials that would work for that, and that's basically part of my process. Dealing so. with anything that you touch, feel, or um, and well, my first piece was about music. Actually, it's called. It was a jazz piece called "Kind of Blue," and my second and third pieces were about Bronzeville. So, what do you do with these pieces? Um, well, they were most recently on display at LA Art Core in Little Tokyo as part of Project Bronzeville, because Project Bronzeville was a multidisciplinary um, art project. So for who? For, for who? everyone who you know, for the public, generally. So who brought this together and said um, Bronzeville? Well, I did, actually. I came up with the idea because in 2009, after I made my first Bronzeville piece, a few years later, I saw a production of the play Bronzeville at LATC by the Roby Theatre Company. And I met the director and the producer, and I said, I wish I'd known about this before because I've been making art about Bronzeville. And then I started thinking, well, how about, you know, because so many people don't know about the period, I wanted to make sure that there were multiple points of access. What was your biggest challenge? Uh, my biggest challenge was time and money. Mm. <laughs> so we, I started planning it in 2011. We wrote grants for the theatrical portion, 
And then we had an Indiegogo campaign that benefited all four areas. And I wanted to make sure that each of the nonprofits involved also got a donation at the end, which they did. And then I, um, I met Hillary, actually, through Dr. Christopher Imenezi West. He was the former history curator at the California African American Museum. And I used to work with him as a graphic designer. And we would talk about Bronzeville. All right. Well, why are you wasting your time on that? And that happened so long time, long time ago. How do you because defend that? Why should we give money to this? Are there black folks in Little Tokyo now? Um, it's possible, but mostly because... Well, uh, that's interesting. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, because They're here? Well, you know, they were actually in Little Tokyo before it was Little Tokyo. Oh, right. Um, we established so, that. Um, but uh, I think for me personally, I s kind of feel like Hillary does, that if you... It used to bug me that people didn't really understand L.A. or its history, and they would assume that wherever people of color lived... Um, it was always, you know, a slum or there was something derogatory to say about it. And I thought, but you're saying that about, you know, whole portions of the city that you don't really know anything about. Because all sorts of people, you know, groups of people, ethnic groups, have lived all over the city. For instance, in Lamert Park, which most people think of as an African-American area, there was a substantial Japanese population before the war. So, and you could even find you know, remnants of that today. My, I have a friend who's African American who a few years ago purchased her home in Lamert Park from a Japanese family. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it's, for, uh, you know, I just feel like it's important to know the history of where you live because there's a, there's a sort of a master narrative that tends to wipe out the history, wipe out the painful parts, you know, oh, we don't want to look at that because it, you know, it happened a long time ago. So you know, your project, your involvement uh, yeah. uh, with, with uh, Hillary also mm -hmm. is destroying the myth yeah. of coexisting or existing. So then someone might ask the question, well, how come Brownsville didn't survive? Last? Because there was a vested interest in not having it survive. Um, Parker Center was built and that pretty much killed Bronzeville. And also, you know, they decided that the powers that be decided that it was better to rent to, you know, Japanese Americans and to sort of move black people south and elsewhere. All right. That's so, always a very conspiratory yeah. phrase. The powers, powers that, that be. be. I'll let uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Hillary <laughs> give, give us your take on why it didn't, or would you echo what she said, or well, no, yeah, what, what would you add to it? That's very accurate. I mean, essentially what happened was that uh, in 1950, the city announced that they were going to take this whole block of what became Parker Center that was part of Little Tokyo The notorious police chief Is Parker. William H. Parker, yes. Okay. Um, so once they uh, announced that, a lot of people moved out ahead of the bulldozers or what have you, but basically it was like it was clear the whole block was going to be gone. And, and that block had, a, a, it's a very large block, it had a slew of Japanese American businesses. It also had a lot of residents in hotels um, and other, pla other rooming houses on that block. And about 90% of the people who lived there were black. And there was 3,000 people who lived on that block. So once Parker Center, once the city came in and said we're going to build Parker Center, that pretty much killed off Bronzeville, mm. you know, so many that people was having to demise of Brownsville. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and it was really because the city said, you know, we don't really value real estate associated with either of your communities, so this is convenient. Let's build it here. Now, to, now, now some of the viewers out there may be wondering who's Parker, and why is he important or unimportant? Depends on how you look at history. Mm. Well, William Parker was uh, the police chief in Los Angeles for a very long time, all the way up through um, uh, the Watts riots in 1965. And he was very, um, he was about professionalizing the police force because it had been kind of known for corruption before he came in. But as part of professionalizing it and being so law and order by the book, he also was really racist. And the police brutality cases and complaints of police brutality really skyrocketed constantly while he was chief. Mm. Very powerful coming from you. I must say that. Because sometimes uh, when people deal with history and explore history, they want to keep it nice, 
and sweet mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily the dirty part or the part that's the true part of the whole package. Mm -hmm. Although this person may be effective in law enforcement, he did need some help in some areas, mm -hmm. be it him or Hoover. All right, how do you explain or how do you create the demise of uh, African Americans in Little Tokyo? Is that a part of your art? Well, or? I think for me, um, the second piece I did um, kind of addresses that a little. It's um, I cast my hands in glass, spelling out Bronzeville in sign language, and then each hand, there is a series of three panels with glass attached to it, and the names and the names of people and businesses that were around are etched in the glass, and then each panel has a Japanese character at the top, so when you read it, it across, it says Blue Copper Town, which is not an exact translation, but if you put the colors blue and copper together, you kind of get a... Um, a bronze, and then town is more, I didn't want it to be village, I wanted mm -hmm. it to be sort of slightly urban a little bit, and sort of small town feeling, so that's why I used that character. Um, but the reason I like to work with glass, because when you look at the sculpture, you can actually see through it. So it's transparent, but it's also reflective. And, so and you, how powerful mm -hmm. Is that you well, that media? Why, why that reflection? You're looking through something, and then you're also looking at yourself. So my other, one of my other Bronzeville pieces was a glass house. It's called Colored People Glass House, and it has, gla it's a glass house built with glass people that are colored glass on one side and mirrored glass on the other. So when you're, and then there's a, um, an electronic picture frame that scrolls images of Bronzeville, and along with an interview with William Hirodo, who was a writer, a reporter for the Rafu Shimpo uh, newspaper. But when you're looking at it, you're also looking at yourself if you're kind of eye level with it. And I really like that, you know, that kind of juxtaposition where you're looking through something, but you're also having to kind of confront yourself. So that's a kind of a theme. Transparency is a big theme in my work, so that's why I like to work with glass. So is, in some ways, you absorbing this, you're looking at this art, but mm -hmm. you're also checking yourself out at this. Right, Same. and you're also thinking about the history, the names of the people that were there, the businesses, the and the, and it's because it's in sign language, it's sort of a silent label, you know, because most people don't know that Bronzeville existed at all. Um, there's only one reference to it currently. Well, there are two. Um, there's a there's like a kiosk on First on Los Angeles Street, I think it is, or Judge John Aiso Street, that mentions Bronzeville. And then in the street, um, there's a, an art piece by Sheila Levrant and Sonia Ishii called Remembering Old Little Tokyo. And they have a reference to it on a timeline that's actually engraved um, in the street on First Street. So you can find like limited references to it. you're not too busy walking. Exactly, which most <laughs> people are, so they don't uh, see it. And so that was kind of the challenge what, what with research. Is the, uh, not to cut you off, oh, what okay. is the, the challenge of having art on the ground versus art standing up looking at you? Um, well, obviously the art on the ground is permanent. So okay. so I was I used to drag p my friends over to look at it, actually, um, the ground piece, because I said, you know, you're literally walking over history in this right. part of town, and most people don't know about it. And I've taken many friends to see the installation. And it always, because in, a, in addition, there's a timeline that tells you what businesses Japanese businesses were there um, from the time of the arrival of the Japanese. And then there are quotes from Japanese citizens engraved in brass in the sidewalk from when they were taken away to internment, along with little images of the things they took with them. So, and, and that's why when I walk down the street, I always feel like there are ghosts there, because literally, you know, in a way there are. So, so using the various elements for art. Mm -hmm. What element is your biggest challenge? Mm -hmm. um, actually, well, the research was really challenging because there's n nothing. I was able to find one copy of the Bronzeville News, which so was a newspaper actually published in Bronzeville. Um, there's only one copy left on my microfiche. It's really tattered, so you, it's almost parts of it are unreadable. Um, but there are ads for breakfast clubs and you know the Bronze Hour, which was a radio show. Um, and a clinic run by Leonard Kaufman called the Bronzeville Clinic. And then there was also another publication called The Bronze that was published out of Club Alabama. 
um, and it was sort Very of um, it was like a glossy slick sheet. Mm -hmm. So it had original graphics um, drawn by African Americans um, advertising the various clubs, like the Plantation Club and the Cobra Room, and you know barbecue joints and. But yeah, I think the biggest challenge was just finding photographs from the period, quotes. Um, I did research over, well, I was always, I was literally doing research right up until so, June of this so year. This so this is where Hillary comes in, uh, that yeah. written part. Exactly, I used Hillary's um, article and. Uh, now when you asked her about it, mm -hmm. you want to use the, her written information. Yeah, well How I'd asked her to collaborate on the project um, uh, I'd asked her and Dr. West and Dr. Anthony Macias from UC Riverside if they wanted to do the symposium portion of Project Bronzeville, and they all agreed. Instantly? So, no reservation? Um, I don't think there were reservations. Hillary, any reservations? Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. I had no reservations. Yeah, yeah no, you was, said you could, you could. No, I think I, more people should know about this history, so I'm, I'm with Kathy on that. That just seems very clear to me. Uh, yeah. And, uh, the public, how did they react Definitely. to it? We actually got a really good reaction to both the art, to everything really, the art show. We also had a jazz concert at the Blue Whale in Little Tokyo, which is a little jazz club tucked away in the corner of a shopping center. Still um, exists. Still, oh yeah, it's a new, relatively new. Okay. It's owned by Jun Lee, um, but we, I have a friend by the name of Miguel Atwood Ferguson and he has an ensemble. So he did arrangements of music from the 40s and uh, including some of my personal favorites. So such like, as such personal as Laura, favorite. the okay. theme from Laura, that um, 1945. Which uh, is around what Laura? Oh, it's a it's a classic film noir. So it's a it's a, it's a great tune. Um, he did work uh, tunes from John Coltrane and um, Charlie Parker and uh, Duke Ellington. They did Black and Tan Fantasy, a special arrangement that Miguel had done. So mm -hmm. it, um, so yeah, and we had a really good response. Uh, we got a lot of nice press from local papers, the Downtown News, the Los Angeles Magazine. But there was there were some people that yeah, were not. What yeah, did you, what did you? I did have a friends and enemies. Because what did when they you're, say? When you're dealing with history, it's really disruptive. So there were people that were really angry. I like that. Say that again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're dealing with history, it's it's disruptive. Why? Your, Why does it create an earthquake? Because people are invested in their view of mm -hmm. what went on in the past. And when you when you have a concrete piece of evidence, a photograph, a quote that says, you know, this happened and they didn't know about it, then they get kind of upset. So I did have people say, you know, I can't believe I didn't know about this. And who are you, you know. to bring it to? Us? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> who made so, you the messenger? And you know, and I said, well, I didn't know about it either until I was haunted by it when I would walk down the street. So, um, and then I had a gentleman who. All was, right, all right, stop. You okay. said a word that fascinates me. What? You were haunted by it. Yes. Describe that feeling, that drive. What was the haunted? Because you know. Some people think haunted. They think, of, oh my God, what's over my shoulder? What's going yeah, on? Yeah, it's a. It was a couple things. Um, my grandmother, um, who was African American, but the older she got, looked very much like a little old Asian lady when she okay. aged. And so when I would walk down the street, I would see women who looked like her, and um, and I would wonder about again, you know, whether black people lived in the neighborhood. And, um, but it just seemed like things kept happening that would poke at me that made me want to pull it all together into one project. Have you ever did an art piece on your mother? Um, no, not yet. <laughs> I planted that seed. Yes, I know. It's, it's a seed that's been there. I've been thinking about it, but I think I'm, I don't know. I don't know if I want to go there, so to speak, so it's possible. Well, you put it out there. I did. So it I has did. to be uh, so uh, maybe created. It's now, possible. The driving force so this story would not be told. Mm -hmm. You sort of touched on that. As you, the deeper you dig and the more you expose, it's got to be something that you find out that, wow, they sort of blocked this part. Or yeah, I think mostly it's just leaving out you know, nobody. A lot of people don't like to look back on the period when Japanese citizens were interned, mm -hmm. um, because it's not America at her best. So, 
leaving that out of the sort of grand narrative of the history of Los Angeles is fairly easy. Um, and when it comes to the history of African Americans, a lot of people tend to use only the um, sort of uh, choke kind of uh, stress points, like mm -hmm. a, a, you know a, a riot right. or a killing. Mm -hmm. Or, um, but what really impressed me about Bronzeville, I remember back in 2011, and this was another impetus to do the project. 2007, rather. I gave a lecture on Bronzeville at the Will Fendel Club, which is the oldest African American women's club in Los Angeles. It was founded in 1945 by Paul Williams' wife, Della Williams, and two Paul of her friends. Paul Williams for history? The architect, yes. yes. For those of you who don't know, Paul Williams, the architect. So his wife and two of her friends founded the Will Fendel Club, and they asked me to talk about Bronzeville and bring slides, and I did. And there was a woman sitting at the table. And she told me a story about a Japanese family that she, her family knew that they were, and they were friends. And she said when we, she referred to a woman in the family as my Japanese sister. And, and she said when my Japanese sister's family was taken away, we held on to their possessions in our garage so that they wouldn't lose everything. And she said, and then we visited them. And when they got out, we gave them, you know, their possessions back, but they were so kind of distraught by what had happened to them right. that they actually left Los Angeles and went finish. back to, I think they, she said eventually they went back to Japan where they, you know, and the family stayed in touch. But she said, you know, I haven't thought about my Japanese sister in years. I don't even know what happened to her. All right. Now, now for those that's wondering, we dropped the name Paul Williams and we yeah. both sort of said, oh, we know him. You yeah. said architecture. Mm -hmm. Architecture for who? Architecture, well, he did residential architecture, but he also did, um, he also did, you know, commercial structures, uh, mostly for white clients, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, uh, he's probably the best known African American architect in Los Angeles. For Apollo the Williams. stars. Exactly, for the stars. So. And uh, yeah, and one of his buildings, um, there's the Golden State Insurance Building on, mm -hmm. on um, I think it's... What is that? It's Adams and remember the not Vermont, but make them search it out. Yeah, LAX yeah. also. LAX also the building that now houses is totally different now. Yeah. But. yeah, the building that houses the Neon Museum in Los An in Las Vegas is also a Paul Williams structure. Okay. So if you're ever out there and you have a chance to visit the Boneyard, um, which is where they take all the old neon signs, that the building that houses the museum is is a Paul Williams building. All right, I, I, I have to get this in, and time mm -hmm. is ticking. And when, Hillary, when you talk with your friends and you say, oh, I'm working on Bronzeville, <laughs> what is the conversation like? Um, What's what? the most? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's the most after? What? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, and for the most part, that it's what is that, and then I go into my spiel and I, I explain. Because, you know, it is not a very well-known story. Um, in LA or, or elsewhere. I mean, LA isn't even the only place that had a Bronzeville experience but like this. But wait a minute, some of these viewers out here, but you're white. Why, why would you want to spend your time on that, <laughs> to put it very politely, okay? Uh, well, I, I came to it, I was doing, um, I was trying to find a dissertation topic and I also had this interest in historic preservation. And um, I got asked to help out on a, a symposium on preserving the ethnic landscapes of America. Wow. And it was being held in Little Tokyo in the old Union Church, which is now the Union Center for the Arts, which mm -hmm. is where LA Art Corps is, which is where Kathy's show is. <laughs> it all comes full circle. And um, uh, kind of a similar experience. I don't know that I would say it was an experience of haunting for me so much as being down there and working on this symposium and thinking about these questions about, well, what, what is an ethnic landscape anyway? What do we right. even mean when right. we say that? Um, that and I what do felt, we mean when we say ethnic landscape? Well, what? this is why, I mean, any landscape, if people live on it, is an ethnic landscape, right. right? I mean, these ideas of like, well, some things are and some things aren't, it's just our way of like trying to normalize whiteness by not naming it and saying like, oh, we're just gonna talk about Thai town or we're gonna talk about, you know, Little India instead. So it partly was thinking through that process um, in, in working on this symposium, but also being down there it is this space where, in part because of the preserved buildings, um, and in part because of the art and the public art, you really do get a sense of, I can access at least pieces of this story here, and it's very rich. And a lot of other places in LA have just as rich stories, but they're 
a little more buried or they're maybe a little harder to, to feel when you're in the space. Whereas, I don't know, for some reason, Little Tokyo, it doesn't feel as buried. So you're like an archaeologist <laughs> in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Somewhat, yes. Some, all right, dealing with the, the pain of the past mm -hmm. is such a phenomenon for any culture, but why so much in America? Mm. My, my take on that is we tell ourselves we're a country that came together by choice, right? Oh, you chose to immigrate here. You chose to leave behind other places that went, worked along older traditional modes of life. But why do we, why do we suppress it? Why do well, we because wanna... if, if you're investing in this idea that it's a, it's a nation of people who are American by choice, which of course is a really problematic idea, but people are very strongly invested in it, then it's hard to accept pain as part of that narrative. And Kathy, what do you say? Suppressing I, well, the pain of yesterday. Even though currently in Hollywood we have movies out, right. uh, The yeah, Butler, yeah, 12, 12 Years, years of a Slave, slave yeah. a little yeah. different from but other. You'll, you'll notice that movie was made by non-Americans. Mm -hmm. I mean, the director's English, the, I think the, main the film, yeah, main English. actor is English. So I don't think that film could be made by an American studio. Um, I'd be, I mean, I'd be surprised. So why do we suppress it when... Well, actually, as an artist, you don't suppress it. You sort of poke around and dust it up a little. So I guess I, guess I think of that as my part of my job. But I think, um, I think there's a certain um, built-in uneasiness with um, our country's history that will probably never go away. Um, because, and, and because we don't deal with it, you know, that's why it, it's sort of like a, a principle of therapy. You can't get beyond something if you never deal with it in the first place. So does it present a challenge for the future if we uh, can't deal with it? We're, we're experiencing that right now. We're stuck in, in a our, civil in war and it's yes. 2013. In our exactly. current politic, body politic, we are experiencing that right now. So, um, yeah, I think all you can do as an artist is try to illuminate it, throw some light on it, um, poke around at it a little bit. and get people thinking. I mean, one of the nicest things about Project Bronzeville was that it got generations of people talking to each other about their history. I heard that, you know, in personal anecdotes from families. But I also heard from people who literally look at the city in a different way because they know it happened. All right, if you if you're going to create a a breaking news story on why Bronzeville is important through the printed media, what would you say? Oh, mine would be that places matter, that they organize people's experiences and their opportunities. And just because you name something with some simple nickname, like Little Tokyo or Bronzeville, frequently that means people think it's okay to kind of wipe it off the map or never go there, like mm -hmm. you said, you know? And it's not, it's the opposite. These are the richest places that we have. These are where we all come from. And we need to reinvest in them as opposed to erase them. And as we fast forward into the future, how important is mixed media? Oh, it's very important because it, it's, you're basically, you have all the tools at your disposal and you can, you know, kind of, it broadens the conversation in terms of art, you know, um, not just the materials you use, but the way in which you use them, um, the, you know, places that you can make art, public art, you know, private art, it's, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be an artist if I weren't, I'm, I'm not a portrait artist, I can't, you know, draw someone's body, so if I, didn't, <laughs> if I didn't use mixed media, I don't know how I would say what I needed to say, so. And if you were, wanted to tell a young person out there to explore history of various cultures, what would you say to them? Uh, well, what I always tell my students is if you want to understand the future, you're going to have to know the past. So if you want to try to plan for your life <laughs> in any way and, and be able to, to see what's coming and know how to respond to it in a successful way, you're going to have to know what people did before. All right. And then, Kathy? I would say there are hidden histories everywhere. You know, probably in the block where you live, you know, the store you go into every day or some old building that you pass. Um, and, you know, it's kind of up to you to kind of find out what that history is because you can probably learn something from it. All right. You're telling me it's time to wrap it up. It's unbelievable. Have to bring you back again to explore more <laughs> sure. about African Americans in Little Tokyo. And to the viewers out there, I would encourage you, 
and your children, to always take time to explore history from a positive aspect. Uh, history comes with uh, sweet and bitter. And if you know anything about good cooking, you know you need them both.